I guess the, uh, the starting point, I think, for my talk on racial profiling probably ought to be, what is it? Uh, we've all read some about it. It's been kind of visible. It was particularly visible in the media up until a couple of years ago, and after 9-11, it's taken a little bit of a turn, and I'll, I'll get to that. But racial profiling has been defined by some of the uh, scholars as being whenever law enforcement detains, questions, searches, arrests, or otherwise investigates a person because of law enforcement's belief that members of that person's uh, racial or ethnic group are more likely than the population in general to commit a certain crime. So that I start with a definition simply so that we'll distinguish profiling or racial profiling in particular from the more normal mode of law enforcement investigation which we all know is legitimate under the Constitution and under all of our laws and that is where there's individualized suspicion for the police officer or law enforcement officer who sees an individual uh, lurking at midnight in front of the uh, jewelry store downtown with a uh, hammer sticking out of his or her back pocket there's individualized suspicion, and the basis, therefore, under the Constitution, under the Fourth Amendment especially, for police to detain uh, is beyond question, but not so in the profiling situation, necessarily at least. Uh, profiling, by contrast, is really a sweep or a dragnet of individuals based on a uh, single characteristic in the case of racial profiling or in a set of characteristics in some circumstances. Prior to 9-11, the prototype racial profiling situation um, arose on the highways of our country. And law enforcement across the country, uh, many times upon training by the uh, drug and federal drug enforcement agency profile use, used a type of profiling to make drug interdiction stops. In other words, and th actually this was made kind of famous not very far from us uh, over here in Volusia County uh, when Sheriff Vogel some years back, late 80s, was the sheriff over there. It was quite a bit of publicity. The Orlando Sentinel ran an entire uh, series on the stops that were taking place on Interstate 95 over in Volusia County. The method that was used there was one that eventually caught on and got used throughout the country by law enforcement seeking to make drug seizures, uh, seeking to target arrest um, those who traffic in drugs on the nation's highways. And the method would go like this. Uh, police officers would see a particular vehicle um, it might, and, the, and again, the, the, even the vehicle in this kind of circumstance might be part of the profile. Certain kinds of vehicles to uh, drug enforcement agencies' view were more likely to be running drugs than others. So police would look for the, to the type of vehicle, the time of day that the travel was taking place. Um, if they made a stop, they would ask the driver or occupants about point of origin on the assumption that some cities in particular are drug source cities, uh, Miami, Los Angeles, New York, whatever, although the, of course the same can be said for most any big city in the country. Uh, if, if law enforcement made a stop under those circumstances, if the driver was particularly nervous, uh, that would be used as a uh, profiling factor, if you will, as a characteristic to continue the detention. In the car, if there were air fresheners, just as another example of a trait, a characteristic that might be considered to be typical of drug runners. Uh, and then what would usually happen in these drug interdiction profiling cases, police officer usually had done what? Stopped the driver for a traffic infraction. Now, as we all know, uh, law enforcement could probably stop any one of us a lot of the time 
for some traffic infraction, whether it be as minor as some kind of an equipment violation exceeding the speed limit by a mile or two, um, whatever. There are lots of them. So the way this would work, police officer makes a stop based on a minor traffic violation, and police officer has these profile characteristics in mind of a drug runner on the highways, stops the vehicle, engages the driver in conversation, very often doesn't issue a traffic ticket, um, but instead would wind up asking the driver for consent to search the vehicle in an effort to find drugs. A lot of litigation ensued over that, and eventually, as some of you may recollect, there were high visibility cases out of New Jersey and Maryland especially, where it was so it was explicitly clear in state trooper memos in those states that part of the profiling was based on racial characteristics, that black and Hispanic uh, drivers and motorists and occupants were far more likely to be stopped than were white occupants. Eventually, the Depart Federal Department of Justice entered into a consent decree, in fact, with the state of New Jersey uh, to see that that kind of practice was stopped. Public opinion with respect to that kind of drug profiling turned very negative in the heels of all that publicity. Uh, and public opinion show polls prior to 9-11 showed that 80% of the citizenry or so condemned that kind of racial profiling. Then came 9-11. Now who is the target of the profiling? No longer the, the penny anti-drug runner. Now it's the terrorist, right? The threat to national security. And now instead of the main thrust of racial profiling being on the highways, it plays out in the nation's airports, on the nation's airplanes, now, instead of the characteristics of the typical drug runner, we have a somewhat looser set of characteristics of the international terrorist, um, phony passports, fake driver's license, a prayer rug, perhaps the Koran in his or her possession, and most significantly for our discussion, an appearance uh, of a Middle Easterner. The public attitude, obviously, has changed with respect to this kind of profiling. Now national polls show that 70 to 80 percent of the American populace are in favor of this form of profiling. And the law has followed suit. In the fall of 2001, shortly after the 9-11 attacks, Congress passed the U.S. Patriot Act that I'm sure you've already heard some about in this symposium authorizing law enforcement across the country to do what? Detain individuals for up to seven days if they're immigrants suspected of involvement in terrorism. Um, authorizing law enforcement to make roving wiretaps where telephones to which uh, suspected terrorists have access can be tapped uh, pretty much at will. And the law also authorized nationwide search warrants for terrorism investigation, unlike anything seen uh, since the days of the founding of our country when the famous writs of assistance were condemned. And as we know, some of the fallout also since 9-11 has been that the Department of Justice has conducted, conducted hundreds of voluntary interviews with individuals simply based on their males of a, in a certain age range, uh, around up to mid-20s or so, um, and they're of Middle Eastern appearance. Why? Why that set of racial characteristics? Obviously because those were the characteristics of the 9-11 hijackers. Some hundreds of other individuals fitting that racial, those racial traits are detained, some of us, it's not altogether always clear where, um, in locations by immigration uh, law enforcement around the country. So what is the, what's the legality of this kind of racial profiling? Let me know. 
The U.S. Constitution has two provisions that are particularly on point. The Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, when police, law enforcement detain somebody, whether it's on the nation's highways or whether it's taking somebody off of an airplane or detaining them in an airport, that's a seizure of the person. Government doesn't have the right to do that to us without some basis. Is racial profiling in suspicion of terrorism an adequate basis? The U.S. Supreme Court would say no with respect to the Fourth Amendment. The U.S. Supreme Court has clearly held that pretextual reasons to stop individuals, to detain individuals, uh, don't matter, don't violate the Fourth Amendment so long as there is some other legitimate basis for the stop. The classic example being on the highway, if there's a, somebody has exceeded the speed limit and they get stopped, even if it's by one mile an hour, it doesn't matter that the police officer actually made the stop because the driver was a minority person. Same thing's true in, in the terrorism context. The other provision in the Constitution that may, and this one's more interesting and controversial, and I don't have time to really go into it, uh, is the Equal Protection Clause. And the Equal Protection Clause says exactly what it means, that individuals in our society are to be treated equally by government regardless of uh, any of their traits, certainly including racial traits, and there are rafts of cases in U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence dealing with this issue. And there's one pending before the U.S. Supreme Court now, and I'll end with this thought. The U.S. Supreme Court basically has taken the direction in the last few years that the Constitution must be colorblind. And it's, that may be a sentiment that many of us agree with. After all, if the decades and centuries of racial prejudice that we're trying to distance ourselves from, if that's to come to full reality, then we should be colorblind as a nation. Um, well, that means no affirmative action programs. That presumably might mean no racial profiling, even in the, even in the terrorism context. But there are, I suggest to you, no politicians, including judges in the country, that are going to go in that direction uh, in the era in which post-9-11 exists. Thank you. Professor Robert Worf of the Berry Law School. Up next, talking about civil liberties during wartime, let's welcome Professor Drew Lanier of UCF. Good morning. Um, I wanted to talk about the context in which civil liberties occur during time of war because they are so special. The premise when we deal with speech and press and other kinds of civil liberties uh, for these notions is that uh, it, they're premised on the democratic notion of self-government. That is, the freedom to believe, not act, but believe as you wish. And this is the idea that Congress can make the law, but then they have to live it under themselves. Now, that's important for us because that keeps the nation under control and that keeps the government under control, and that prevents those in power from uh, usurping uh, control for the nation. Now, the irony in free speech, and my constitutional law students know this, and I see some here, is that the closer that speech comes to being effective, the more likely to be suppressed. Now, deal with that for a minute. That's an irony, isn't it? And so that's the context we need to deal with when we're talking about civil liberties during times of war. Context is important because history teaches us that governments tend to be more oppressive in times of crisis. Emergence, emergencies may result from war or depression or natural catastrophes or internal rebellion. During such times, the nation's very survival may be at stake. The government may be unstable and political dissent and opposition to the government are more likely to occur. And the responses of political leaders then are fairly predictable. That is, they will place a priority on national unity and national security and take a firm stance against subversive groups and opposition. Often these reactions take the form of policies that restrict the right of the people to speak and publish and organize. Now the U.S., the world's first true democracy, is no exception to this rule. In times of peace and in times of prosperity, there is little reason to restrict freedom and expression. The government and the nation are secure 
and the people are relatively content. In times of crisis, however, during times of war in particular, the President and the Congress may react harshly, contending that some forms of expression must be curtailed to protect national security. In response to that, political dissidents may challenge such actions as being unconstitutional to the Supreme Court. But remember, the Supreme Court justices themselves are subject to public opinion, subject to the ways of patriotism, just as the average citizen are. Now, let me give you some history to tell you how far back this goes. Even the framers were subject to this particular context, contextual effect. That is, uh, they were vulnerable to the patriotic atmosphere that permeated society following a major crisis. Not long after the Revolution, they passed something called the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. Now listen to what this did. These acts made illegal the publication of any, quote, false, scandalous, or malicious writing with the intent of defaming the President, the Congress, or the government, or of exciting against the government the hatred of the people, or to bring it into contempt or disrepute. How many journalists will be out of jail? None. Okay. Because they all do that to some extent, and that's really their purpose to a large extent. So why did our founding fathers do that? These uh, men who treasured liberty so much, why did they do that? The answer is context. Context is a matter. During the time the Federalist Party was controlled of Congress and they feared uh, the Jeffersonian Republicans coming to power and taking away their power and so forth. And so they instituted these rules that really uh, suppress speech during a time when you think speech would have been at its greatest. Abraham Lincoln did the same thing during the Civil War. Lincoln, the emancipator. Lincoln, the freer of the slaves. Lincoln, the, uh, the, 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 the champion of the, of the common man, suppressed free speech. He suspended the call, something that's called the writ of habeas corpus. And he did that because newspaper editors are written bad things about him. And he imprisoned them uh, in military tribunal. And the court reviewed that in a case called Ex Party McArdle. And the court basically said, well, uh, they just they dismissed the case on jurisdictional grounds, but they basically upheld what the president had done. And they did so, uh, they addressed another case and called Ex Party Milligan. Now, when World War I came around, the big fear was there of communism and socialism. And Congress had passed uh, the Espionage Act of 17 and the Sedition Act of 1918. We can talk about those later. One of these um, acts was challenged in a case called Schenck versus the U.S., in which Mr. Schenck, who was General Secretary of the Socialist Party in Philadelphia, uh, was convicted of violating the Espionage Act of 1917 for distributing 15,000 leaflets that encouraged men who were listed in a local newspaper as eligible for service to resist the draft. Now, in reviewing that conviction, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great dissenter, the great liberal of the court, said this. Now, this is Holmes speaking. He says, We admit that in many places and in ordinary times the defendants in saying all that was said in the circular would have been within their constitutional rights. But the character of every act depends upon the circumstances in which it is done. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting theater, uh, fire in a theater and causing panic. When a nation is at war, many things that may be said in time of peace are such an hindrance to its effort that their utterance will not be endured so long as men fight and no court could regard them as protected by any constitutional right. That's home speaking. And the point is, context matters. I always have to remember context. I tell my constitutional law students that you cannot look at any right in a political vacuum. It doesn't exist because you have to look where it occurred, why it occurred, and so forth. World War II, you look at the Japanese internment case, Korematsu, in which we as a nation interned people of Japanese descent, Americans, because of their color. We did not intern Italians. We did not intern Germans. We didn't intern Russians. No one else but Japanese. And the court in Korematsu upheld that. Now, I asked my students before 9-11, do you think this ever could occur again? And their answer was roundly, no, it can never occur again. We're better than that. They give me a different answer today. Okay, Look into your hearts. Do you feel that you could do that? And in, uh, in the Nazi saboteur case, ex parte Curran, 1942, eight Nazi saboteurs were uh, arrested, convicted, 
They challenged their conviction uh, before a military tribunal. Uh, they sought habeas corpus relief uh, under the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, and the court rejected their pleas, holding that the constitutional safeguards did not apply to them because their offenses were against the law of war. All right. So the point is, is that what matters? What is it? Context, right? Context matters. And so when you look at the Patriot Act or racial profiling or whatever, my point for you this morning, I want you to take it home with you and put it in your pocket, is look at context, because context will bring you there. Now, let me also make you feel a little bit better, and that is once this crisis is over, once the Depression or the war or what have you is over, historical studies and empirical studies demonstrate that the court returns to a more a uh, vigorous stance on civil liberties. It's not what is called a regime change, where the court will permanently change its stance in terms of civil liberties overall. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Dr. Lanier, thank you very much. And remember, we're going to turn the cameras on you very shortly. We do want to hear your questions in a few minutes. But first, let's have our final uh, panelist here, Professor Chris Dolan of the University of Central Florida, talking about transportation security. Professor? Hello. Okay. Pr Professor Lanier talked about context, uh, legal context and political context. I hope to really advance political context here. One thing I try to get across to my students is uh, I spend a lot of time in my classes, in my policy classes, talking about politics. In our national security class this semester, I spent two months on why and how decisions are made, not the actual decisions themselves, because how and why is almost as important or is even more as important as the policy result. Uh, someone had mentioned before, um, if politics can just get out of the way. Well, that's, it's, that's almost impossible. That's like asking people to stop breathing and to continue living, uh, from, from my perspective. Uh, uh, I would say one of the more popular questions I get from my students is, well, were we asleep in the 1990s when Bill Clinton was president? Well, context is important especially the mid to late 90s, times were good. Economic prosperity, people were making money on the whole. People did not want to be bothered by Cobar Towers, by the first World Trade Center bombing. People didn't want to be bothered by obscure embassy bombings in East Africa. Until the economy turned sour in early 2000, when the USS Cole was bombed, then people started to take attention towards this little thing called terrorism, which, had, which has always been with us as a society. It didn't just uh, rise to the occasion under Bill Clinton or under President Bush, Bush 41. It's always been with us. And we talk in terms of, well, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? My answer is politics. I'm always at, um, uh, another frequent question I get from my students is, well, how can we prevent future terrorist attacks? Well, my answer always will be, we're never going to prevent terrorist attacks from occurring, whether it's in the transportation system of the United States or whether it's against um, commu uh, the communication sector of our society. We may not be able to prevent terrorism, but we can surely minimize it. We can live with it. We can live with the threat, and that's the sort of issue that the public, I think, is struggling with right now. Um, due directly to the September 11th attacks, I would say that the federal trend towards decentralization, that is handing back to the states authority that it had taken from them, to put it simply, uh, in the 60s and in the 70s under Johnson and Lincoln, and handing that authority back in, in the form of policy devolution under Ronald Reagan, under President, uh, President Ronald Reagan, under uh, the first president, uh, George Bush, and under Clinton, came to an end on September 11th. That's clearly the case. I would say with the creation of specifically the, specifically the uh, Transportation Security Administration and its placement in the Department of Homeland Security, I would say that the introduction into, of uh, national security issues into the domestic policy domain has produced a strong imperative for more direct federal policy management. Um, because of the perceived legitimacy of the federal government on security matters and what seems like a permanent terrorist threat making this war different from World War II, uh, or even Vietnam to a certain extent. 
centralization and federalization of transportation security seems justifiable to the to the public. But there are major consequences for civil for civil liberties in the United States and the rights of travelers in this new era of terrorism. As several initiatives passed in response to the public's need for security have relaxed traditional government protections of the traveling public. On uh, November 19, 2001, President George W. Bush signed into law the Aviation and Transportation Security Act after the Senate voted to support it in a 100 to nothing vote. The act expands federal authority in the security management of civil air travel, the essentials of which the President initially opposed even after 9-11. President Bush, President George W. Bush's opposition was premised largely on the argument that the federal government, uh, that federal governmental expansion was inappropriate, a view mirroring the leadership of congressional Republicans. I argue that Bush was ultimately in a politically untenable position and had to reverse himself on the federalization of airport screening speaks to two related tensions in post 9-11 governance. And I'll, and I'll get to those issues um, in a second. I, I also argue that because of the newly perceived security threats, several trends in public management that have prompted greater administrative decentralization have significantly been interrupted and, are, and have come to an abrupt end, as I said. Critical policy authority and decision making has shifted significantly to the federal government, a sort of reinvigorated centralization that has been the uh, result. Now to my two specific points. September 11th has altered, altered the political imperative surrounding the distribution of authority in a federal system that in that arguing for greater federal authority is now politically tenable in a broader variety of policy domains. Second, the attacks made a clear management imperative for greater coordination of policy action and response. Now. Both of those two points are in conflict with one another. The first point suggests that political context, political imperatives, protecting your turf if you're a decision maker, is important. So we cannot forget political context. And second, the idea of management and coordination and cooperation. I would argue that those two are, have always been in conflict in the United States. But from the 9 o'clock presentation this morning from uh, local law enforcement in Brevard and in Orange County, um, that coordination is improving, but we are not going to be able to arrive at a point at which um, uh, we're all on the same page, as the sheriff uh, uh, said. Okay. Security has been the centralization imperative in this case. The two immediate responses to increasing domestic awareness, preparedness, and prevention, again, or limitation of terrorist attacks against U.S. transportation systems were the passage of the the Aviation and Transportation Security Act, and President Bush issuing Executive Order 13228, which created the Office of Homeland Security, which eventually evolved as a White House office into a greater bureaucracy known as the Department of Homeland Security. Both responses reflect the logic of centralization necessarily necessary to confront policy challenges associated with external threats like terrorist attacks. But the implication is, and the drawback is, when you reorganize the federal government and policies are not significantly on a wholesale level altered, what are you reorganizing? Most likely you're reorganizing your problems before September 11th into a post 9-11 department that provides the public with some sort of sense of security. We go to the airports, we see the long lines, we see the TSA, the Transportation Security Agents, um, going through our bags, examining um, what's in them, in our checked luggage, in our carry-on luggage, that provides us with a sense of peace of mind. We're seeing it in action. If you go to Orlando Airport right now, you, it, it's out in the open, and that's, and that's deliberate, to have the public view this new sense of security. Well, is that enough? And are we really, reorg are, are we really taking a stab at increasing the security of the public, or are we putting on a show? or are we just simply reorganizing our problems into a new department? As, a, as, as an interesting aside, I, um, I've been writing a paper on the whole implication of the Transportation Security Administration on civil liberties, and I interviewed several TSA agents at Orlando Airport. Now, the interesting thing is I interviewed them while they were working. Think about that for a second. Has anything changed? I was interviewing one gentleman who I'll keep his identity 
uh, anonymous, um, was talking to me while he was searching a bag. I mean, how easy would it have been for me to just drop something in there or have someone slip something over into, into a bag? Has anything really changed, or is this a showpiece for the public? Um, okay, now with respect to the whole idea of security versus uh, liberties. Okay, while the TSA is responsible for securing all modes of transportation, its main goal is protecting air travelers in the nation's over 400 airports. It is entrusted with regulating two specific areas of private and commercial air travel, passenger screening and cargo screening. The TSA also possesses law enforcement powers with the Federal Sky Marshal Program and works through a newly established Transportation Security Network Program, or TSNB, with other local, with, with other local state and federal law enforcement agencies, such as the FBI, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the CIA. Therefore, the mission of the TSA is broader than aviation security, and its activities will be more than screening, as its job includes examining and assessing threats. So threat assessment is part of the mission of the new Transportation Security Administration across the entire national, secure, national transportation system and preventing or limiting disruption by terrorists. Politically, as a new bureaucratic organization, the TSA must overcome two hurdles if it wishes to continue to effectively promote America's internal security. One, creating itself within the political framework established by the President of the United States. And two, devising a system for stopping terrorist threats to civil and commercial air transportation. At the outset, there was a tension as to what the TSA's actual mission is or was or will be, with some officials skilled in law enforcement clashing with members of Congress who demand better customer service. The TSA's first chief or head was John W. McGaw, M McGaw. And, and, the, and the TSA, uh, I'm sorry, TSA's first chief, John McGaw, was frequently at odds, specifically with his boss, Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta. Now, I don't know if any of you remember this specific incident. The fact that the TSA, specifically McGaw, was inept on the day of the most violent terrorist attack since 9-11, on July 4, 2002, when an Egyptian terrorist opened fire at the Israeli El Al counter of LAX killing two underscores how after nearly a year of building a new federal agency to take over airport security, few broad changes until then had taken place. The event led Mineta to replace McGaw with the current TSA chief, James M. Loy. Furthermore, with a handful of air with, while a handful of airports are beginning to see tidally uniform TSA screeners at checkpoints, the TSA has struggled to keep up with hiring, and many airports still use some private screening companies that were in place before 9-11. The government has ordered sophisticated bomb detection machines to scan luggage, but the program is so far behind schedule at smaller airports. At ticket counters and gates, airline and security employees sift through travelers' personal possessions, sometimes while being interviewed by political scientists, in random suitcase searches. Although the government is developing a new computer system to identify people with questionable backgrounds, again, politics. It is dependent on antiquated software that assumes terrorists book flights, book flights while paying with cash, buy one-way tickets, or board flights just prior to takeoff. I do that all the time, and I'm not a terrorist. There is no question that the TSA has a difficult task to perform, as there are, there are legitimate security concerns. To facilitate the process and with its fully and with its full fury directed at preventing further terrorist attacks, Congress has assumed a completely new approach to aviation security with the TSA. Every past security rule that had been beaten down by the airlines or airports would not only be reinstated but enforced now with deadlines. For example, flimsy cockpit doors are now secure. All checked luggage would be scanned. Airport screeners would be given financial incentives to do their job well and attendants and pilots would get advanced training to deal with hijackings. Hijackers, excuse me. Okay. With the TSA, the dramatic increase in federalized, federal centralization of transportation security and policy has also led to a significant contraction of individual civil liberties. September 11th and the ensuing war on terrorism has produced a preoccupation with internal and external security threats from particular groups within and beyond society which are often targeted as security risks because of their ethnicity, race, religion, or political beliefs. 
However, as R Robert Nisbet has suggested in his book, The Present Age, no nation in history has ever managed permanent war and permanent in a permanent security leviathan at its heart and has been able to maintain a truly representative character. We need a strong sense of history here to guide us in our future. Now, based on this examination of the structure of several elements of civil air transportation domain in the wake of September 11th, se strong security imperatives do, necessitate, do necessitate a more active management role by the Bush administration to protect air travelers. Because virtually all ideological perspectives in the U.S. see security as an appropriate task for the federal government, national security concerns and their introduction into transportation policy make that assertion of federal authority less problematic and more justifiable. The dynamic is likely to be sustained as long as terrorism remains a perceivable threat. And as long as American citizens view their security in exchange for their civil liberties as a sort of rational trade-off, um, that, that likelihood is, is to continue. Now, in conclusion, President Bush's rhetoric of a nearly permanent and total war on terrorism and his focus on the nation's threatened disposition is likely to maintain reinvigorated national government authority over transportation security into the future, even with implications, severe implications for civil liberties in the United States. Thank you.